Thank you for being our first person sure. guest today. Um, let's begin with talking a little bit about your parents. Tell us about who they were and their lives before the Second World sure. War, please. Well, my parents uh, were born in Eastern Europe, in a part of the world uh, that prior to the First World War was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, after the First World War, uh, their little hometowns uh, became part of Poland. My mother was born in a small town called Rimanov, and my father in a neighboring town called Kanchuga. And, uh, you know, there were very few opportunities in those towns. There was also increasing anti-Semitism. Uh, so uh, sometime in the 1920s, uh, when they were about 18 years old, my parents left their home. Uh, they actually followed in the footsteps of uh, some, some other people who had left the town. One, one person I like to mention from my mother's hometown, from Rimanov, which, you know, people have this, this idea that these little towns were very backward, uh, especially if anyone has seen the movie, you know, Fiddler on the Roof. But in actual fact, one of the people who came from my mother's hometown was a man by the name of Isidro Rabi, who came to the United States and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1946 for the discovery of electromagnetism. So here you have it, someone coming from one of these little towns. Well, my parents were not in that same category, but my, my father left home directly to go to Holland to start a men's clothing business. And my mother went to Berlin, where she joined older siblings uh, and worked in, in their business, actually, until she finally uh, joined my father, as you mentioned, at the end of 1932 in Holland, where they were married. And you mentioned that your uh, father had started a men's clothing business. There's still actually a sign there, isn't there? Yes, uh, even, you know, just a few years ago, I, I was in Holland, went back uh, to our former home, and then right next to our home uh, was my father's business. And lo and behold, uh, this, this huge sign uh, of, it says Siegfried Munzer, uh, tailor, and a little bit of a white light, tailor from Vienna, uh, you know, sort of boasting. Uh, that big sign is still there, uh, to, to my great surprise. So your parents made their way to Holland, uh, both for economic opportunity, but as you mentioned, also to escape anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish feeling. Um, what do you know from your mother about what life was like for them in Holland in the 1930s? Well, by, when my parents arrived in Holland, they, they joined a fairly wealthy, well-to-do Jewish community uh, that had been established in Holland for hundreds of years, uh, was totally integrated uh, into Dutch uh, society. Uh, they were in the arts, uh, they were in the government, um, and really, uh, you know, it was a, a very well-established uh, Jewish community that in some ways went all the way back to the expulsion of Jews in 1492 uh, from Spain. So they had been there for, as I said, for a very long time. My parents made many, many friends, uh, most of them uh, not Jewish, and, and really, you know, their business thrived and they really had very good lives in Holland and their family expanded shortly thereafter. Yes, uh, as my father's business flourished, uh, so my, my parents felt confident enough to start a family. Uh, and uh, in July 1936, uh, my mother gave birth to her first child, and that was my sister, Eva. Interestingly enough, um, Eva was born just about the same time that the infamous Berlin Olympics were held, which Adolf Hitler tried to turn into an instrument of, of Nazi propaganda. So here you have it, you know, the, the beginning of the, the rise of the Nazis, uh, really just a few hundred miles away, actually really a, almost pretty much in almost the middle of the Nazi era. Uh, and in Holland, you know, people celebrating a very happy occasion, uh, the birth of a young daughter. And when was their second daughter born? Uh, my sister, uh, Liana, Liana, or Leah, uh, was born in uh, 1938. She was born November 12, 1938. 
And that too is a very important historical date uh, because she was born just three days uh, after what is called Kristallnacht or the night of broken glass when the full fury of anti-Semitism was unleashed in, in Germany uh, and in Austria. And it's when hundreds of synagogues were destroyed uh, and thousands of Jewish businesses were plundered uh, in, in Germany and in the German Reich. And so here you have the contrast again uh, of a very happy occasion, uh, the birth of their second daughter, while uh, the Nazi era you know, is progressing just a few hundred miles away. And then less than a year later, on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, starting World War II. Uh, by the spring of 1940, the war has come literally to your parents' doorstep with the German invasion. Uh, tell us what you can, what that meant for your family and for other Jews living in Holland to fall under Nazi rule. Well, that was uh, represented really a very, very major change in their lives. It actually uh, began <coughs> during the night of May 9th to 10th, 90, <coughs> sorry, 1940, uh, when my parents had been asked to host a member of the Dutch resistance movement, uh, a man who had a briefcase with him that supposedly contained plans to preemptively destroy the major railroad center in the city, city of Utrecht. Uh, with the expectation that destroying that railroad center might slow down any invasion uh, coming from Germany. But the following morning, my parents and their guest listened to the radio and they heard that the port city of Rotterdam, the largest port uh, in Europe, had been bombed and destroyed by Nazi invaders. And just a few minutes later, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands came on the radio and announced that Holland had surrendered. And uh, she told people to, to do their job or their duty everywhere, wherever they happened to find themselves. And it was actually um, my parents' guest who was the first one to speak up. And in Dutch, he said, Hot dank, it is ten einde. Thank God. It's over. You know, as far as he was concerned, uh, he, would, he had done what he could by being a member of the Dutch resistance movement. He had tried to slow down any invasion, and he now would just have to try to accommodate to living under an occupation. But my parents, uh, thinking of their two little children and knowing what had happened uh, to their relatives in, in Germany and in Berlin, their relatives remaining in Poland knew that things were going to get very hard and uh, that they were going to be very much alone. And indeed, almost immediately, all of the restrictions on Jewish life that had been put in place over years in Germany and in Austria were put in place in Holland over just a matter of days. So you know, one of the first things that happened was that the ritual slaughter of animals was banned for kosher meat. And you know, some people might have thought, well, you know, it's a so-called humane measure. Uh, but then Jews had to register as Jews. Jewish men had to take a new middle name, Israel. Jewish w women, a new middle name, Sarah. And then there were regulations that really made absolutely no sense whatsoever, even if you assume the others did. And that's that the Jews were prohibited from going into public parks or from using public transportation. And you know, when you have a regulation like that, that makes really very, very little sense, people tend to disobey it. So my mother told me that you know, uh, she defied the ordinance and she would take my little sister uh, Leah in the baby carriage to the park. And uh, one day, a German woman approached the baby carriage and my mother's heart almost stopped because she knew she wasn't supposed to be there. And then 
the German woman looked at my sister in the baby carriage and she saw blonde curls and blue eyes and she turned to my mother with a smile and she said, ah, you can tell that this is good German Aryan blood. Well, my mother thanked the woman, of course, and then she left the park and never went back there again. This was just, you know, one of many episodes uh, that showed, you know, the terrible conditions under which Jews lived in Holland during those er even early years of the occupation. So there were all of these measures to identify and track Jews, uh, to marginalize them through law in society. Uh, by March 1941, there was a big economic impact when uh, Jewish property was, quote unquote, Aryanized. Can you tell our audience what that meant? Well, that meant that uh, my father's business, for example, had to be registered uh, and then officially became part uh, of, of German ownership of the German government. Uh, they had to, my parents, um, you know, had to surrender their jewelry, for example. Uh, and it really meant impoverishing uh, the, the Dutch Jewish community. Uh, and, um, you know, fortunately they were able to hide some of their possessions. But again, this was a major step, you know, towards isolating the Jews, towards restricting their business activities, uh, and making life in general miserable. You know, some of the uh, uh, family members, there was one family member especially who had tried to, es who escaped from Germany to join our family. It was my father's brother, my uncle Emil. And he had hoped that by leaving Germany and crossing the border into Holland, that he would be safe. And, you know, he joined our family and initially indeed, you know, this was uh, before the invasion. Indeed, you know, they had a fairly normal life together. But after the invasion, of course, it became really miserable. And the stranglehold on the Jews living in Holland became worse and worse. Um, by August 1941, Jewish children were banned from public school. Uh, your parents had already made a different decision uh, with regard to your sister Eva in school. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, my, my two sisters were, were enrolled in a Catholic school as a way of hiding uh, their Jewish identity. Uh, and, you know, that, that and eventually that led to, to where they were hidden, actually. But this was also just about the time when my mother found out that she was pregnant again. And it was an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, and uh, she consulted her obstetrician and the obstetrician told my mother uh, in no uncertain terms that she should have an abortion. He told her that it would be immoral to bring another Jewish life uh, into the world. And my mother wasn't particularly religious, even though she came from a very traditional Jewish background. But you know, they, they were sort of rebelling against that, my, my parents. But at that time, my mother turned to the Bible for advice. And she read the story of a woman called Hannah, a woman who was desperate to conceive and would go to the temple every year and pray that she might have a child. And it was in reading of Hannah's agonizing desire to have a child that my mother decided she could not possibly have an abortion. Her obstetrician fired her as a patient, uh, and so nine months later, uh, I was born with the help of a nurse uh, at home. That's November 23rd, 1941. There was November 23rd, 1941, really 18 months into the Nazi occupation. And, you know, that was brought about another dilemma uh, in Jewish life, because traditionally, Jewish baby boys, when they're eight days old, are circumcised. It's really a major milestone uh, in a Jewish life, the first milestone. And my parents' friends uh, said, you know, don't have him circumcised because it will identify him as being Jewish. And uh, this time, the answer to my parents' dilemma came in the form of a worried look on the face of a pediatrician 
who had just examined me. And my father asked the pediatrician, is there anything wrong with the baby? And the ped pediatrician smiled and said, no. He said, it's nothing serious. It's just that your little boy needs a minor operation that we call a circumcision. And so eight days later, our family gathered in our living room uh, and observed this, this first milestone in a Jewish life, probably uh, the last such ceremony uh, held in the city. I was born in, uh, in The Hague. Uh, and what was very special about that day, obviously, as I said, a very important milestone. So my parents had pictures taken. And what we have actually are two very small photographs about one by one and a half inch in size taken at that ceremony. And you sort of can barely see my two sisters, um, my uncle Emil, the one who had joined us from Germany, and some other people in that picture. And then I'm in the second picture. And what made these pictures very special is that my mother was to keep them hidden on her body through her subsequent stay in 12 concentration camps. And she developed this feeling, this superstition, that if she ever lost those photographs, it would mean that I had been killed. Fortunately, my mother survived, the photos survived, and I survived. And those photos now are so fragile and they're so valuable that I did not want to keep them in the house. And they are now part of the collection of this museum. But it's, you know, just one of those little stories that comes out of, of an event like that. Uh, but as I said, the last such celebration in Holland. Well, thank you for entrusting us with the, those, you know, precious photographs. It's sure. really our sacred duty to care for them. Um, and I'm struck when you mention the choices your parents had to make, the leap of faith to bring another Jewish life into the world at this very perilous moment, the um, historical coincidences that coincided more or less with your sister's births, that when we talk about history and part of what's so amazing in these conversations is to realize that people are still leading their lives. It's easy to look at history as just a series of dates and decisions by important people in offices, but that it happens to real families, to real people with considerations and on a different trajectory. Sure. Yeah. Um, so they have this new baby, they have two young children, they don't have a reliable way to make a living. Um, what happened over the next year until September 42? Well, in just about mid-1942, September, August, September 1942, I guess when I was about uh, six, seven months old or so, uh, and there's a beautiful photograph. Oh, you saw the photograph earlier of me with my two sisters taken probably precisely at that time. Uh, that's when Jewish men were beginning to get notices to report for so-called labor duty. And it meant going to a concentration camp, a labor camp, uh, somewhere in Holland. But also knowing full well that that might be something temporary and that they might well be sent on, you know, much further east uh, to concentration camps uh, located uh, in Poland. And so this was really when many Jewish families made the decision to try to find a place to hide. Now, some families, like a famous family of Anne Frank, went into hiding as, as one family unit, the famous attic that the Anne, Frank, fa Anne Frank's family occupied in Amsterdam. My parents made a different decision. They decided that as a form of insurance, to make sure uh, that even if all other members of the family were taken by the Nazis, at least some the others might have a chance to survive, that we would split up. So the first ones to be placed were my two sisters. Uh, a, very, a very devout Catholic woman had a dream uh, in which she saw the Virgin telling her to take Jewish children into hiding. She told that story to her priest. Uh, the priest told the story to my parents' neighbor. And so 
my two sisters were entrusted uh, to, to this woman's care. Uh, <clears throat> my father uh, committed or tried to show and uh, claimed to commit an act of suicide or, uh, and uh, that gained him admission to a psychiatric hospital, pretended, that's the word I was looking for, pretended to commit an act of suicide. And that gained him admission to a psychiatric hospital where he went into hiding. Uh, and um, as we said earlier, Jewish boys were more difficult to place, but eventually uh, my mother's neighbor, a woman by the name of Annie Matna, agreed uh, to take me in at least temporarily. And at that point, my mother joined my father uh, in that same psychiatric hospital, in her case, pretending uh, to be a nurse. And that's when she closed the door on our home for the very, very last time, after having found my father, having gone into hiding, having found a refuge for my two sisters, a refuge for me, and she finally then closed the door on our home for the very last time and joined my father. Um, Annie Magna, the woman I had been left with, uh, had had some bad run-ins with the Nazis. And so she was scared uh, that they would find that she was hiding a Jewish baby. So she initially passed me on to a sister. And um, then it turned out that the sister had a neighbor who was a member of the Dutch Nazi party. And so she got scared. She was afraid that he might hear a little baby crying. So she passed me back to Annie. And then finally Annie decided to pass me on to her ex-husband. She was divorced and had been married to a man born in Indonesia. And that's how I ended up with an Indonesian family uh, for the rest of the war years. Um, and Al, if I may interrupt, just for sure. people less familiar with Dutch history, Indonesia had been a colony of the Netherlands, so there was a sizable Indonesian immigrant community living in the Netherlands. Yes. Yeah, Indonesia, as you said, was a Dutch colony, and many Indonesians in the early 1900 uh, had come uh, to Holland, including my new foster father, the man I called Papa for the rest of his life. Um, he uh, came to Holland with his mother, as I said, in the early 1900s uh, and became, eventually became the manager uh, of an Indonesian restaurant. And uh, a woman, there was a woman who worked there who was also Indonesian but of a much poorer background. Her name was Mima Saina and um, she was completely illiterate. Uh, uneducated, did not speak the Dutch language, only the Indonesian language. Uh, but she was a very good woman. She worked in the restaurant, like many other immigrants, doing menial work. But Papa Matna realized that she was really good and very kind, and so he hired her to take care of the three Matna children. And when I joined the household, she is the one who then assumed the role of being my nanny or really my mother, Mima Saina. And even though this woman was completely illiterate, uh, uneducated, uh, Muslim, uh, she had a heart of gold and she would walk miles every day, you know, just to get milk for me. Since I was in the home completely illegally, uh, there were no ration coupons for me, ration coupons which you needed to get any kind of, of milk or bread, whatever. And so she would have to mile, get, walk miles just to get milk. In fact, you know, just a few years ago when I was in Holland, uh, a woman stopped me and said, you know, you used to drink my milk. And I asked her, what do you mean? And she said, well, she said, you know, during the war years, all children in school were given a small bottle of milk. And my mother told me to save half that little bottle for the baby next door. And you were the baby next door. And this is how, you know, you have a little girl, perhaps eight or nine years old, 
already participating in saving uh, a human life. I'm told that I slept in Mima's bed and that she kept a knife under her pillow vowing to kill any Nazi who might try to come uh, and get me. Uh, but, you know, whatever memories that I have of that time are really actually very happy ones. I remember Papa Madna playing the piano. I remember that there was a little dog in the family and actually for, you know, little Jewish children who were placed in hiding were given a new name. And uh, I was given the name Bobby. And to this day when I talk to my foster family, the family that I was hidden with, I always have to use that name Bobby. And for many, many years, I thought I was given the name Bobby after the little dog that they had. <laughs> in, in, with the reason for that was so that if neighbors heard Bobby being, kill, being called, they would think, well, they're just calling the little dog. Well, I told this story just about two years ago to one of my foster sisters, Devi Matna, who's 87 years old. And I told her the story, and she said, you're absolutely wrong. The little dog's name was Teddy, not Bobby. <laughs> so there, you know, there went that whole theory. And the reason I was called Bobby was probably after uh, the third of the Madna children, who was a little boy by the name of Robbie, Rob Madna, Robbie Madna. And those two names also are very close, same theory. Neighbors hearing Bobby being called with them would think, well, they're just calling you know, Robbie, and another way, of course, of making sure that people did not know uh, that there was a strange Jewish baby in the household. I wasn't allowed out of the house at all. For how long? Uh, for about three years. Uh, the only view that I had of the outside world was through a mail slot. That was my total view of the outside world. That's how I grew up, and then I was allowed a little bit in the backyard, fortunately. Uh, and there were also two neighbor children who were allowed to come in and play with me. And the reason they were considered safe uh, was that they were German, but their parents were German communists. And so they were very staunchly anti-Nazi, anti-fascist. And so they were entirely trusted to come in uh, to the house and play with me. But I think just to imagine any of us who live with or have lived with a toddler um, just being caught up in a room for an hour can feel like years, three years that you're inside. Um, and, and jokes aside about it, how risky and how tenuous your situation was, um, the networks of trust that were required, people must have known in the neighborhood also that there's a little white boy living with this Indonesian family. More, more than just one or two people knew. Sure. Yes, uh, many years later when I came back to Holland and uh, went to, into an Indonesian grocery store with Papa Madna. Uh, a man pointed to me and said, Bobby, he immediately, you know, seeing the combination of an Indonesian man and someone Caucasian, he immediately knew that I was the little boy that he had heard about many, many years earlier. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, some people in the Indonesian community certainly were aware of my presence uh, and, and kept that secret. There were times, though, when uh, I'm told the house was being searched. Uh, and uh, what I remember about it is just having to go into a little cellar uh, and, you know, someone closing the door on the cellar was really more like a closet. And uh, I would play there with the Christmas decorations of the family. That's the memory that I have. I don't remember anything that the reason was that they was there was because the house was being searched. Uh, but that was one of those occasions and one of those memories that I have. Uh, Papa Manda told me that uh, he had told uh, the Germans when they searched the house and questioned the presence of a Caucasian child he told them that I was the illegitimate child of his ex-wife and that she now had a new boyfriend who did not want me around. And that's how he explained the presence of this little white little boy in a household of people, of three other children, older children, who looked very, very different. I find it very hard to imagine um, 
the courage and the mindset of your parents to give up their three young children to the care of strangers? Did they have any news of you or your sisters, any contact with you? The last, they had very little contact with me, actually, uh, as far as I know. Uh, they saw my sisters one last time uh, on Christmas Day, uh, 1942. Uh, that's when my two sisters were brought to the psychiatric hospital and for just a very brief moment uh, a family was reunited, at least that part of the family. But then, just a week later, on New Year's Day, 1943, the psychiatric hospital where my parents had been hidden uh, was emptied of all uh, patients and staff, and they were all deported and sent to concentration camps. Uh, my parents first went to a concentration camp in Holland called Westerbork, which has a big transit camp. From there, uh, they were, went to another concentration camp, still located in Holland, uh, called Fucht, where they were assigned to do slave labor for the Philips electronics factory. And my mother told me that uh, one day, that every morning, there would be a lineup of all the prisoners. And she said that one day, a very high Nazi official came to visit the prisoners and address the prisoners. And that was a man by the name of Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's second in command. And he exhorted the prisoners. He said, if you keep working for the success of Germany, of the German Reich, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And my mother told me that way off in the distance in Holland, she could see the spire of a small Dutch church. And she said it would be so wonderful if peace were to break out at that moment that she could just run to that church, fall on her knees, and thank God for having survived. She didn't care whether it was a church, a mosque, or a synagogue, just a place to thank God. But of course, that wasn't to happen and um, the promise that Himmler made to the inmates, to the prisoners, wasn't kept. And just a few months later, uh, that, that camp was emptied of all prisoners and they were all sent on to Poland, to Auschwitz. Uh, and that's where my parents were separated. My father remained in Auschwitz for about six months and my mother was sent on to another camp called Reichenbach where she continued to do electronics work for the Telefunken company. And all the while, of course, they thought that their children were safe. Uh, that was one bit of satisfaction. And one thing that I really think kept them alive at the time was this, this idea that you know they had children to come home to eventually. Sadly, sadly, um, the husband of the wife, the woman who had taken in my children, your sisters, who had taken my sorry, my sisters, <sighs> denounced his wife as hiding two Jewish children. So the Nazis took his wife. She was imprisoned, but eventually freed. But my two sisters were immediately sent to Auschwitz and killed and they were only six and eight years old. They were killed February 11th, 1944. And that was something, of course, that my parents did not know about at the time and that my mother was to learn much, much later. Uh, they knew nothing of what was going on with you and you were obviously too young to know, but you say you have memories from the winter of 1944 to 45 as especially bitter. Yes, so that was uh, when there was absolutely no food left in Holland. The only thing that was there to eat really was ground up tulip bulbs, which Holland had many of. Uh, and you all know about the famous Dutch tulips. Well, people would grind up the tulip bulbs and sort of create a mush or pudding out of that, and that's, that's what sustained uh, people. And what I remember is that uh, 
one evening I saw the table set uh, with plates and I thought we were going to be fed. I was going to be fed. So I sat down, my chair at the table, and fell asleep, my head falling into the plate. And that's how the family found me the following morning. So I remember the very intense hunger of that very last winter in Holland. Uh, what happened to your parents for the duration of the war? Well, my, my mother, uh, as I said, uh, she, she was in this factory called Telefunken where she also assembled, where she assembled radio tubes. She had learned that that was an essential thing for the war effort. And my mother took some satisfaction at that time uh, in working alongside German soldiers who had served on the Eastern Front, who had been repatriated from, from Russia. And they were minus an arm or a leg. They had been severely injured, were no longer fit for duty. And so they were sent to work alongside uh, in this factory. And they had become so anti-Hitler that they did everything possible to sabotage the workings uh, of the factory. And so that encouraged my mother to, end, to start her own little acts of defiance. And one of the things that she did was she would spend a whole day assembling one radio tube and then when the, when the siren was sounded at the end of the day to indicate the end of work, she would disassemble the radio tube, put all the parts back in the drawer, and then start the process all over again the following day. An act of defiance that really, I think, kept her going. Another act of defiance was observing Jewish holidays, or trying to. And one of them is the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is when candles and a festival of lights. And so uh, my mother told me that the women would go to the infirmary and tell the nurse that they were having their menstrual period and needed a wad of cotton. And uh, they would then save a little bit of oil from the machinery they were working on, fashion wicks out of the cotton, and put those into a potato, which was the only kind of food that they had. And then in the evening, light that little wick and that's how they continue to observe the holiday of Hanukkah something that really again an act of defiance that I think kept her alive my mother eventually witnessed the bombing by the allies of that factory and she said a Hebrew prayer of thanks to God when she saw the factory going up in flames thanking God for having survived to see that particular day uh, but that wasn't the end of her ordeal because uh, my mother then was put on a whole series of death marches as the uh, Soviet army approached. All of the prisoners were marched further and further back west uh, until my mother finally came into a camp uh, at the Danish border where she, was, where she was liberated through the intervention of a man called Folke Bernadotte who was the head of the Swedish Swedish. Red Cross, and my mother then was repatriated, sent to Sweden to recuperate. My father, on the other hand, uh, he, as I said, remained in Auschwitz, was sent on to a horrible camp called Mauthausen, then to three more cam camps in Austria, uh, Gusen, Steyr, and finally a beautiful place high up in the Austrian Alps called Ebensee, where he did horrible work assembling V-2 rockets for the German army uh, in abandoned salt mines. And terrible, terrible work, uh, debilitating work. Uh, and But he did see liberation by the American army. Uh, but he was so weakened that he passed away two months later and he's actually buried in that concentration camp uh, in Ebensee. Uh, I have visited you know, his grave there, and the only time that I've really shed tears for my father, that I really understood the loss of, ha of a father, is when I stood at this grave and broke out in tears. Your mother, having managed to survive, returned to the Netherlands, hoping to reunite with her children. How did she learn what had happened to her two little girls? Well, Devi Matna told me that my mother came to there, to her house, which is really her mother's house, the woman I had been left, left with initially, and she was the one 
to tell her that my sisters were no longer there without any real details. I don't know exactly when my mother found out or what happened to my, to my sisters. But then she took me, she took my mother over to the house where I now was. And that's the very first clear memory that I have. <clears throat> I remember being asleep in one of the back rooms of the house and my sister Devi coming to wake me up and carry me into the living room where the whole family was sitting in a circle. And I was cranky and crying. So they did what you typically do with a crying child. They passed me from lap to lap. And what I remember is that there was one lap I wouldn't sit in. A woman I kept pushing away, and that was my own mother, because she was you know, a complete stranger to me. I already had a mother, and that was Mima Saina. And uh, my mother knew that it would be very difficult to separate me from Mima, so she decided <coughs> that Mima ought to continue to care for me while she, my mother, went out looking for work. But that only lasted a few months because in October 1945, sadly, uh, Mima had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed away. And I have very, very few memories, actually, uh, of Mima uh, Saina. I remember visiting her grave. Uh, and another memory that I have that I recently or a few years ago for the very first time was able to share with uh, students from Indonesia visiting the United States uh, to learn about what religious pluralism is about. And I told them the story of my family, showed them photographs of me with Mima, and then at the very end I said, you know, I have almost no memories of Mima except that she used to sing a lullaby to me and it was called Nina Bobo. And this whole group of students suddenly started singing it in unison. An amazing moment, you know, that brought tears to my eyes. And after that, um, these young women, Muslim women, young with Muslim women wearing traditional headscarves came up to me, hugged me and kissed me and said, you know, we are family. An incredibly, you know, incredibly or a powerful moment that I will never forget. And uh, it's, it's one moment that really gives me a little bit of hope in my story. And you should know that Al continues to work with groups from Indonesia, with survivors from the genocide in Cambodia. He really understands um, and um, puts your heart into knowing what your story can do to build bridges. Uh, we have just another minute or two before we open to questions. Um, I do want you to tell us about an incident at the movies that happened. Your mother has come back to the Netherlands. She's lost her husband, two of her three children, her extended family, but she has to try to sure. continue with life. Sure, and so my mother, you know, tried. She, she really wanted me to get used to being alone with her rather than really being entirely dependent on Mima. So my mother gave Mima a ticket to go see a movie and uh, my Mima left the house and then she came back a few minutes later and wagged her finger at my mother and she said, don't hit him. That's how protective Mima was of me that she didn't even trust my own mother you know, to care for me. Uh, you know, a woman who was really totally uh, devoted uh, to me. In fact, some people say that you know, she passed away not just of a cerebral hemorrhage but because of a broken heart, she was so afraid that she might lose uh, the little baby that she had cared for. And Al, you were able to get the Madna family and Mima recognized as righteous among the nations for the incredible risks they took to save your life. Yes, they were recognized at Yad Vashem, the memorial to the Holocaust in Jerusalem, where their names are inscribed as righteous among the nations, people who risk their lives uh, to save uh, Jewish children and adults, uh, people, you know, in this whole sea of evil, there were a few good people like them, you know, who, who really risked their lives to continue to do 
what is right. And so I am, I'm so glad that they were recognized over there. You know, if there had been 10 times or 100 times as many people like them, uh, perhaps the Holocaust might not have happened. Uh, and I think, you know, their lesson is a, is a really important one. Uh, and that's why I continue to share the story with Papa Matnas, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and now with, with anybody coming to visit the museum and students from all over the country, all over the world, because I want them to learn uh, that it is possible to stand up for what is right, even when you're surrounded by evil. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we have two ushers with microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll pass a microphone to you. There's one down here in front and one on the back aisle as well. Pass it down. And if I could ask if you'd keep your questions brief, that'd be great. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Uh, sure, because you got the mic first. Hi, thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, my question to you is, amidst everything that was going on in Europe and learning something I never knew before, that an Indo the Indonesian community uh, that was there, how much fear did they have of the Nazis being Indonesian, Muslim, and in a, in, in, in a place that uh, they were a minority? It's a very good question, and I really don't have a very good answer to it. Uh, in actual fact, you know, what I've been able to learn is that the Indonesian community in Holland was not singled out like the Jews uh, or like African uh, people of African descent might have been. Uh, and why that is, I don't really know. Uh, whether, whether they were not grouped uh, with the so-called inferior races might be one reason. Uh, but many Indonesians living in Holland were part of the resistance movement, a very active resistance movement, especially among Indonesian students. Uh, they were fighting for uh, freedom for Indonesia from Holland, from being a colony, but they said, first, we have to deal with the Germans, and then we'll deal with Holland. That was sort of their motto. If I could just add, one of the other things that you notice if you look at Nazi racial policy is how inconsistent it often is. There will be exceptions, and depending on the context, also a lot was left to the discretion of an individual official in different locations. Um, and even in the way that anti-Jewish policy was enforced varied greatly from place to place. So it is consistent to be inconsistent, is essentially how I would answer your question. Yes, sir. Uh, a number of us in the front couple rows here are from Minnesota, and about a week ago, uh, they announced that they had found a member of the Nazi SS living in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, I think he's 98 years old. Do you have any personal feelings as to what should happen when we discover, when we find someone like that? This is a really tough question, you know. Many, many years have passed. On the other hand, it's never too late for justice to occur. And I think it is important uh, to, to prosecute uh, whatever remaining Nazis there are. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's, there are fewer and fewer of them around. Uh, but uh, if, if we allow their crimes to go unanswered, uh, we're really becoming complicit in, in, in these crimes. And these are crimes that, that really, I think, need to be prosecuted to the very end. I think that's part of the human conscience. I, I'd like to add, if I might, to a couple of other reasons for trials. You know, it's one thing to think about a very elderly man near the end of his life, but part of what trials do, they're also how we as a society express our values. And there's a reason that crimes like murder, quote unquote ordinary murder, but also crimes like genocide, there is no statute of limitations. It's because they really, um, the evil does not, dis does not dissipate with the passage of time. Um, the last thing I would say related to that too is that trials are often a way that we learn much more about the historical record and how crimes are committed. Just a year or two ago there was a trial of a man in Germany, also quite elderly, um, 
referred to in the press as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. He helped to process valuables that were um, confiscated from prisoners. Through that trial, we learned a great deal about the mechanisms, the mass theft that was part of the genocide. So it's not only about the fate or how much punishment can you give a person at the end of his life, but also about um, establishing an unimpeachable record so that people who might deny these crimes can see that the perpetrators themselves gave testimony of it. And I think that's very valuable. Oh, we have a question here. Yes, first of all, thank you, Dr. Munzer, for this outstanding time you're spending with us. What can we learn from your mother after the war, after losing two daughters and her husband and all she went through in the camps? What can we learn from her? What we learn from her, what I learned from her, is the incredible human spirit. You know, the fact um, that she was able to start life over again, to continue with life. I think probably one very important reason for that was that you know, she found me alive and she had me uh, to take care of. You know, my mother <clears throat> used to remind me uh, of uh, that story of Hannah uh, that I told you about. And, and Hannah made a pledge. She said, if the Almighty will give me a child, I will give that child to the service of God all of the days of his or her life. And my mother periodically would remind me of that pledge. She said, you know, I said the same thing. No pressure. And so I want you to succeed. I want you to do the right thing with your life. And uh, that's something that really influenced me. And I think probably why I became a doctor and I've tried to live up to that pledge for my life. We have time for one final question. There was a person here. I'd oh. like to thank you again so much for your uh, very, special and touching stories of, about your family, both by birth and your foster family. Um, but I'm curious to hear your opinions about um, the ongoing refugee crisis in Europe and um, rising anti-Muslim sentiments that are um, occurring in places such as the Netherlands and any parallels that you think might exist between these two topics. I think it's extremely, it's just disheartening isn't even the world. The word, you know, I think the greatest tragedy to me of the Holocaust wasn't just that I was deprived of a father or deprived of the companionship of two sisters, but it was that the world did not learn uh, the lessons of the Holocaust, did not ban hatred and discrimination, uh, that we did not see an end uh, to atrocities perpetrated uh, by governments and there, that there continue to be a need for refugees. Um, and, you know, one of the, if my family had been given refuge in a country like the United States or anywhere else, I might have had a father and I might have had, you know, sisters who were alive. So I feel very much, you know, for the refugees who are trying to find a safe place, a safe haven. And I, I very much hope that there will be an end at some point to the need for refugees. But in the meantime, I think we have an obligation uh, in the world uh, to, to provide a safe shelter for the people who are seeking it. Al does more than hope, I should mention. He's in the middle of um, a tour, actually, around the country with a young Syrian refugee, a man named Moaz, um, as part of the Museum Center for the Prevention of Genocide. I would strongly encourage you, if you're interested in these issues, to look at our website and see the various types of programs and initiatives we do um, to raise awareness and to influence policymakers. Um, we are out of time. I know that Al, that Dr. Munzer will be happy to stay and answer your questions, talk to you afterwards, but it is our tradition at First Person that the First Person guest has the last word, so I will turn it over to you for any closing thoughts. Well, my thought is basically is that, you know, what I said earlier, it's that it is possible, even when surrounded by things that are wrong, surrounded by evil, it's still possible to do what is right. Uh, and that is, I think, my, my the most important message that I really want to leave with you. Well, thank you for sharing your, your family's history with us and thank you for joining us today.